this uh, last talk of uh, this session, session seven of uh, the GU 2022 conference. We're pleased to have uh, with us Natasha Moshinskaya. I hope I, I'm not. Uh, no, no, it's uh, quite good. Yes, actually. Pronounce your name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Natasha will uh, we'll talk about the key characteristics and success criteria for the design of informal science activities. Natasha, welcome to the GEO conference, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Half, half an hour, including questions. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. hello everybody again. Um, indeed, my name is Natasha Mashinska and I'm working uh, at the University of Twente, the Netherlands. And uh, today I would like to share some of the results of the project that the university is participating in, uh, which the project is called Surrounded by Science. Uh, and this talk is probably a bit different from uh, the, at least the talks that I have uh, seen and uh, heard. Um, it's not uh, from, a, a, it's not exactly about astronomy, but it is also about astronomy because we, uh, the project uh, that I'm working for is about any STEM uh, informal learning and uh, the, all the examples of uh, citizens, uh, citizen, um, um, science, uh, very inspiring talk by Petra before. These are the examples of informal learning. Um, so I hope that uh, what we um, have done already and what we are planning to do will be of interest and use for you as well. Um, so the, why can't I change the slide, I wonder? Yeah, now I can. Um, so the name of the project is Surrounded by Science. It basically covers what we are uh, doing and what uh, our goals are. Um, in, the, in the normal life nowadays, uh, people uh, are surrounded by science, but they uh, don't always realize that and they don't always see the connection between this theoretical science somewhere and the life that they live. And that is uh, also quite often true for uh, children or teenagers, so if we talk about the school uh, age range. Uh, so the project is um, one of the goals that we have is uh, trying to uh, bridge these two parts of learning, uh, learning in formal settings and learning in formal settings together to see how they can uh, well, inform each other and complement each other, um, and especially uh, how informal activities can uh, help uh, people and especially children connect to science. And we see this um, journey of uh, learning about science, for example, uh, we see that as a learning ecology or learning path um that never stops basically that of course uh, children learn uh, science in school obviously uh but it's not only there they can uh, learn something while being a part of the uh, after school uh, science club or summer camp they can visit a museum with their family they can uh, watch a documentary or follow uh, a, a podcast of somebody on a social media on their own. And all these together will build into the, the path that um, well leads them to understanding science more in general and connecting to science more. And we would like to know how all these activities, apart from school, apart from formal settings, um, can contribute to this uh, understanding and connection uh, well, we call it science proficiency, but it's not in terms of being the, the best, uh, having the, the highest grades in school, but more about connecting to, to science and understanding how it is uh, connected to your life, how it influences your life. Um, to, to do so, to study these activities and to uh, see the nature of this learning, we uh, well, have to decompose this nice uh, diagram a bit. Uh, and we uh, identify or we distinguish three learning contexts 
we, the first we call uh, scientific outreach programs, and they are um, yeah all these uh, activities that can be after school, uh, summer camp, a workshop, masterclass, a lecture, these kind of um, uh, things. The second uh, learning context is uh, about design environments, and there we talk about the special places or environments that are specifically designed to uh, show some things, to, to demonstrate some phenomena, to uh, let people see exhibits. And it can be museum, uh, planetarium, um, um, a zoo, or a national park, these kind of uh, organizations. And finally, we uh, distinguish technology and media products with, uh, well, uh, you can imagine all these possible channels of information that we have now uh, and technology that can be used. So all online uh, things, uh, simulations, uh, online exhibitions and um, podcasts and uh, these kind of things. Um, so one of the objective of the uh, project is to see uh, what makes successful uh, informal learning activities successful. So what is what is the nature of that? And uh, knowing that, how it can contribute to formal education, but also how can other activity providers learn from this success um, and implement the same design features probably, or similar design features. Uh, so to do that, we first of course wanted to collect information and for that, we talked to people. Uh, we felt we have three main groups of stakeholders in this uh, um, area that we need to, to uh, reach out to. And the first and, of, of course, very straightforward group is activity providers themselves. But they were not the only ones. We also talked to teachers, um, both primary and secondary and high school teachers. Because teachers uh, are people who can uh, decide to bring uh, a class to a museum, exhibition, um, uh, have a field trip, or go to the zoo, uh, have a, a master class or not. So uh, knowing what teachers expect and what they value in uh, uh, informal um, learning is important to well to cater for that or or maybe to manage this expectation somehow or at least to to have a dialogue about that uh, and finally we talked uh, to participants because well at the end they have to be there right to learn they have to be in the museum they have to be in our master class uh, so we asked them what they like and value about um, these activities and why they come here uh, we try to get uh, the information from, uh, well, to have this kind of net as broad as possible. Um, so we, we talk to uh, activity providers from different countries, but also uh, about different types of activities, about different learning contexts. And with them, the uh, talks were the most uh, yeah, profound and deep. They really go into design features. We ask them, what they design, so what types of activities they design, how and why, so why exactly this, how do they know that it works, or do they know that it works. Uh, with teachers, as I already mentioned, we mainly talk about this value that they place uh, on informal education, on formal learning, and um, what, yeah, what expectations are, uh, what is may be missing in the formal settings due to time restrictions, uh, such as divisions and other things that can be reached through informal. And with participants, it was uh, more about the perception, what they like, what they don't like, because yeah, they are the end clients, let's say. Uh, so it's important to know what attracts them. Um, our next step uh, uh, was after we got all these talks, uh, we tried to identify different activity types for each learning context. So within outreach programs, what kind of activities can we have? Because to talk about design, you need to know what are we designing, right? Um, so 
we first use the raw data, the, the way the, the, the words that people use, the way they talked about the activities. Um, and then we try to uh, group them uh, with a bit uh, more universal, uh, in a bit more universal category that would still possess all the main characteristics. And you see some examples on the slide now. Um, for example, a lecture or a series of lectures with some interactivity would can mean uh, a lecture with a debate at the end or a lecture with some demonstrations or a lecture with a walk in the park after that, um, maybe where participants should observe the, the plants, for example, that they were lectured about before. Um, so we, we did that for uh, as much as we could to make the list of activities concise, uh, but still keep the activities distinguishing between each other. So no, no overlaps, but clear distinguish. Um, so here now I will present what we've uh, come up with uh, so far for each learning context and give some uh, explanations to each activity type. Um, so for outreach programs, we uh, now talk about summer after school science club or camp, you can call it differently. Um, lectures, science and technology projects, workshop, series of workshops and scenario based activities. Uh, all are the type of activity like a treasure hunt when you have a map and to, you need to complete some tasks or escape room that are very popular for already quite some years. Um, what I mean with uh, distinguishing between similar types is that as well, uh, a summer a science camp, for example, or an after school uh, science club and science project can in some ways be similar in the types of activities that are there. But we still feel they're different because of several distinguishing features. And these would be um, that the um, science and technology project uh, is always focused on a specific topic. It can be interdisciplinary topic, but it is one topic. And uh, it also has a clear end. So when the product is ready, the project is over. Uh, and also includes uh, the presentation phase that normally you share what you've done either with the peers or with the broader audience. Um, while this, the after, after school science club, for example, can tackle different topics during the, the year or even years of existence and participants can join this club for basically as long as they are in the school. Um, so even though some activities inside the, the, these um, types can be similar, the general types are different. The same goes for lecture and workshop. The, here the uh, interactivity percentage is different. So if uh, a workshop can also start with some introduction and the person speaking, uh, the majority of time is still devoted to um, participants working uh, having hands-on experience, while in the lecture it's kind of vice versa. It's mainly listening, observing, um, and maybe a little bit of demonstration at the end. For the design environments, we distinguished uh, a bit fewer types with the guided tour or uh, unguided tour or design route with task. And uh, the difference between this design route and um, the treasure hunt, for example, that I was shown in the previous uh, slide, uh, is that um, here it's more voluntarily or more free. Uh, while uh, if you are enrolled in the treasure hunt, you probably work with a predefined group, maybe of classmates or, or family, um, and you are assumed or expected to finish the task. And there is some kind of supervision, or at least somebody observes you. And if you get lost, or if you uh, have some problems, then maybe you get extra hints or something like that. Um, while the design route here um, is, is, yeah, it's much freer for you to decide where to stop. Uh, so if you get this kind of uh, map, for example, at the entrance to the zoo, where you need to go and observe different uh, 
animals and maybe complete small tasks, well, you can do the full route, but you can also decide to stop halfway or even do one third and then go to the canteen and uh, enjoy a nice drink after that. Um, finally, for technology and media products, uh, we have everything that can be on a website. And that is, um, well, that varies from very short interaction, like reading some fun facts about uh, science or um, having um, a small quiz to uh, a bit longer interaction with maybe tutorials, how to do an experiment at home or something like that, which were very popular, obviously, during the pandemic time, and to longer interactions um, with this, some study program, even maybe MOOCs or a series of online lectures or these kind of uh, activities. Um, we also talk about uh, some offline th uh, things, so physical, ten uh, tangible books, uh, leaflets, and so on. All kind of media channels uh, and some online things that are now, well, again, after I should repeat myself, after the pandemic, a lot of things have moved online and stayed online uh, together with the offline uh, version. So uh, online exhibitions, online escape rooms, um, this kind of things we also talk about. Um, so what we did next, we uh, looked at the data from the interviews with stakeholders, I already explained who and why and how. And then we of course also looked at literature because, um, well, we wanted our um, suggestions and our results to be well, as much uh, evidence-based as possible. So we did use the uh, bottom-up approach. We talked to stakeholders, uh, but we also used a top-down approach. So we looked at the studies that have been already conducted on experiments, on data collection, on uh, theoretical um, articles or theoretical or th learning theories that uh, exist showing what can be there. And we combine them to uh, identify design features for different learning contexts. So what should work? And this should work goes from practice and from, well, also practice, but through theoretical prism, let's say. And that's what we came up with. Uh, first, we uh, came up with two universal design features. They are not uh, for a specific context. They are for any type of informal activity. Uh, maybe not even STEM, but specifically, of course, for STEM. And these two are the key, they are prerequisites for anything else, because if they are not there, we, well, we can stop, you know. The first uh, is providing correct scientific information. And even though it sounds very intuitive and very straightforward, it still should be there because, well, there are different ways museums are, uh, arrange the exhibitions, uh, a podcast a leader gets the information for the uh, story and uh, all other activities. So it it's always should be checked, of course, that the information is there. And it's not only because if you give wrong information, you mislead people, which is, of, well, already a big thing by itself. But another thing, another consequence is that uh, if later in life people um, discover the right, uh, the correct scientific information, or the piece of scientific information, they start disbelieving science because, well, science told me that, and now science is telling me that, that it contradicts. So it's, it's weird. It creates more misconceptions. It creates more confusion. And that's exactly what, um, well, any learning activity is uh, trying to prevent and trying to avoid. And because it's informal learning, so learning outside formal um, settings, outside formal planning, agendas, uh, curricular, and all these, participants should be motivated to do it. And the best motivation in these circumstances is interest. So it should be fun. It should be interesting for them, fun for them to do, otherwise they won't do it. And then if we, so we apply that to everything and now we go back to our uh, different contexts. And for outreach programs, uh, we 
uh, this defined three, uh, sorry, seven uh, um, design features that are important to take uh, into account. The first uh, is connection to real life, and that is the one that is very commonly used, that's, that's a common for all three contexts. And that is again, uh, an, well, a feature of informal uh, learning, because that's how science can get into someone's life, basically, is that uh, people see the connection, they, they see the boiling kettle, and they think, maybe, hopefully, at some moment about physics, uh, they, about uh, um, yeah, the process, the heat transfer, and these kind of things. Um, the choice of topic, what we mean here, and we're talking about outreach programs, so it's uh, uh, summer camps, workshops, master classes, uh, these kind of things. They either should be um, outside or beyond the uh, school curricula, so kids will be interested to know something extra, or they can be interdisciplinary, because in most schools, uh, subjects are taught really separately. So a thing that would combine these, show different perspective, different angle, uh, are very important. Um, the activities should in encourage curiosity and questioning and inquiry. Um, again, uh, in schools, it's well, quite often very directive learning and uh, students are given answers sometimes rather than being asked to look for them. And these types of activities should do exactly this. Um, personal experience would also uh, refer to connection to real scientists, for example, and seeing them and seeing them as role models and seeing that they're real people and not just something <laughs> um, not clear and uh, wearing white coat and uh, grave head man. Um, collaboration part was also found to be very important. And again, if we talk about summer camps, for example, and seeing uh, like-minded peers is quite important that you are not the only one who is that nerdy and weird and, and likes astronomy, but apparently there are many other people like that. Um, and of course, the uh, appropriateness in age and ability uh, level is important. For design environments, you can see some very similar um, characteristics. I won't mention them uh, again, but I will mention some things that are specific for this context. For example, uh, because we are talking about exhibits mainly, or, well, either live exhibits like in the zoo uh, or not live, like in the museum maybe or somewhere else, they should be attractive. So they, they should be visually attractive. Um, the information sources should be combined. So it's not only watching, but also maybe listening something, maybe touching something, doing something, which uh, of course doing already leads to interactivity. Um, again, because we're talking about museum-like organizations, the materials there should be authentic. That's why we're going to a zoo to see a real animal, not a picture of it. Um, and here, the, the group, the normal groups there would be family. So at least it's quite often that it's a family time. So if we want more learning and more engagement, then some family learning uh, should be encouraged. So while performing something, uh, the family can uh, well, exchange opinions, do something together. For technology and media products, uh, again, I will focus only on the specific ones. Um, is that they should be technically accessible, so they should work on different mobile devices, it should be easy to use, uh, preferably free or, well, at least uh, pro well, possible to, to use. Uh, and they should um, present information in an engaging way. And specifically for media products, specifically for, let's say, podcasts or some radio shows, um, but people may listen to them while driving a car, or while cooking, or while doing something else. So if it's, you know, boring and uh, too difficult, too complicated to listen to, they may stop. Uh, and I'm not saying it should be simplified, but it should be engaging. So uh, activity providers in this category would say using humor, using personal stories, using connection to real people's stories. Um, 
There are some uh, categories that uh, were in, in the brackets had based on literature. It means that um, the activity providers did not initially uh, indicate them, but literature did. And um, we don't see that as a contradiction. It's not that um, activity providers don't agree with this, but they probably just uh, had it in their heads um, that it goes without saying that, uh, yeah, of course, the uh, technology or media product should encourage curiosity because otherwise people won't do it. So if it's not interesting, curious information to well, watch, see, uh, listen, uh, why would people do that? Uh, so that's just an example. But most of them show very, very uh, good sync between what practitioners do and what literature says. Uh, another very quick snapshot um, of the data that we have. Uh, it's uh, what cloud created uh, based on the uh, three, we asked uh, the visitors to say three words about the activity that have just experienced. Uh, and obviously we expect that something like interesting or um, yeah, funny, uh, but it was, um, well, for me personally at least, uh, was very reassuring to see that they also value things like interactive or educational or curiosity, uh, something challenging. So it means that we are on the same page on this. So it's not that we are uh, well, pushing something to them that they don't want, but they also want to learn. They These activities that they like are also educational activities, but of course they should be fun and interesting and interactive. Um, so I'm, I'm rounding up. <laughs> I know my time is, is uh, going to end soon. So in the project, our next steps are... Uh, I have only three minutes left, so my question. Sorry? We only have three minutes. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh... that's my pre last slide. Mm. So it's, um, yeah, we are planning to collect uh, data in some real cases or so go to real organizations and collect this data and see how that helps to um, assess the how the goals are reached. So where uh, the design features actually work the way we think that should work. And based on that, we hope to create recommendations for activity providers, how to design activities with a specific goal in mind. And that was that. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope it was not too uh, much um, methodology of research. <laughs> and if we still no, have a couple of minutes. Uh, no, uh, many. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha, for uh, sharing with us this uh, Wonderful work, actually, uh, based on research and uh, and analysis of data and so on. And uh, sharing with us those important design features, which would work for all science, not only uh, so it's including astronomy. Definitely, yes, definitely, and, yes. And for all the activities, whether they are outreach activities, whether environments, whether these are technology and media products. This is very, very interesting. Um, I'm looking for actually if you have any publications on that, I'd like Yeah, to, we're working on that too. <laughs> uh, to read about it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I open the floor for questions. We don't have much time. So, but uh, yeah, if uh, any comments, questions for Natasha, please raise your hand. Okay, Rosa, go ahead. Uh, just to say, we have a, a comment here on Facebook by Sarah, who is accompanying us from Facebook. She's saying, Natasha, thank you very much for your presentation. This project is very useful for all those who develop informal education activities in STEM areas so that we can properly evaluate the activities that are developed. Two quick questions. Could there be differences in evaluation key features when we talk about different scientific topics, for example, in astronomy? For those who are interested, how can we follow the conclusions and results of the project? Yeah, maybe I should start with the second one because it's a bit easier. Uh, I did not include it anywhere, but if you just uh, Google surrounded by science, you will be on our website. Uh, of course, I can also put it in the chat. Um, and uh, there you can also subscribe for the newsletter. So you will be, uh, yeah, 
on on uh, you will yeah you will be informed about everything that we develop uh, and also the results of course are published there all the deliverables that we submit and everything yeah Rosa uh, put the website in the in the chat uh, so that is uh, the way and uh, yeah indeed we have uh, um, well in social media in uh, Twitter and on Facebook we also have accounts so you can also see uh, our well announcements about our activities uh, there uh, as for evaluation of different topics um well probably don't have much time to talk about that but in very very short words i think it's um less about the topic and more about the goal so when the goal of the activity is to uh, for example give uh, basic knowledge or spark of the interest to astronomy that would be this, this kind of uh, evaluation and uh, design features also. While you're talking about uh, maybe more advanced activities for more advanced uh, users and uh, with more learning on specific area, then other design features and other evaluation procedures should uh, follow. So yeah, that's that would be in a nutshell my opinion about that. So to, to add to what uh, Natasha is saying, there's going to be a wonderful app that will help uh, collect data. And uh, we can, I mean, I know that the hands on universe community around the globe is alert to what we are doing. We will certainly make a big wave in our social media. So everyone is invited to collab collaborate, contribute, and maybe we can learn something that we've been all talking about in global hands on universe for so many years the power and importance of evaluation and how to properly do it. So I think this project will bring some very valuable and important answers to us. Yeah, we, we do thank hope you, so. Thank you, Natasha. Yeah, yeah and thank indeed, you very much. We, yeah, we try to create an app for self-evaluation of activity providers. So you as an organization or person can answer some questions and be given some recommendations. And then of course you are free to decide how relevant they are. Well, be careful, Natasha. You're saying that in front of a global audience. <laughs> People from all over the world accepting your challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this conference.